Gojo. Thank you for joining us today. We are wanting to come to you for our virtual festival and one of the topics we decided we want to talk about was some of the artwork that we have on display in the museum galleries, specifically the work of George Winter. We have several pieces of his art on display in the removal section of our museum galleries and he had a fascinating life and a really critical role in the Potawatomi removals from northern Indiana and we just wanted to let you know a little bit more about his life, his works, and how we use those today to help capture and tell the story of that removal period in our history. So Blake's gonna start off telling us a little bit about George Winter. Well, George Winter was born in June of 1809 uh, to an extremely affluent family. He was the youngest of 12 kids. Uh, his father, William, was a very successful merchant in Port Sea, England. And because of that success, his father would travel around Europe extensively viewing and collecting fine pieces of art, which he would bring back to the house um, for the children to view, but also educate them on the artists and what they were seeing in the works. Young George took a, to a keen lightning likeness to this, and he would begin to copy the works, uh, doing basic sketches, some uh, small paintings and things like that. And because of his travels, William befriended many successful artists of the time who would visit the family, um, give impromptu lessons uh, to the children, especially George, which they took a liking to as well because they could see that he was pretty proficient in art. Um, and from that, his skills began to develop more and more uh, to where he was be able to have a fixed portfolio that would prepare him for later in life. So at the age of 16, George had to make a, a pretty crucial decision. Uh, he was done with his primary school, and the decision was made that he would move to London with his brother um, and attempt to enroll at the Royal Academy of Art. Um, he was conflicted a little bit because his family had moved to America, uh, specifically Cincinnati. Um, he was very interested in American life, uh, politics, and the environment over there, over there but also interested in the Native Americans uh, that he would read in the daily newspapers in London. Uh, so he decided to move with his brother, um, spent about five years in London. He applied for the National Academy but failed to gain admittance. But while he was there, he continued to do study, um, polishing up on his portraiture, uh, oil works, as well as even wood carvings. Um, and at that time, he also had to make a critical decision on whether to continue his education in Paris or to then move to the United States. Uh, he decided to move to the United States, um, centered in Cincinnati, um, but prior to that he lived a couple years with his brother William in New York. Um, from there he enrolled at the National Academy of Design um, and attended that for about three years, where again he continued to hone his skills, um, but also would do artwork and sell it on the side to, uh, to make a profit and uh, to help uh, fund his living. So George made the decision to explore the Native Americans that he had found interest in in both England, um, but also his time in the United States, and understanding that they would soon be removing west to Kansas. Um, he decided to move to Logansport, Indiana, um, and lucky enough, he found a hotel that was just a short distance away from the Ewing and Walker Trading Post, which was the trading hub for that area. Uh, he knew that he would see several subjects and be able to experience native life uh, through the lens of both Potawatomi and Miami that he uh, witnessed there. Uh, so he stayed at the Washington, Washington Hall Hotel, uh, but then he was also lucky enough to discover that uh, proceedings and grievance hearings, hearings, specifically for the Potawatomi, were to be held in the hotel. Um, while he stayed there, he befriended uh, Judge John Edmonds, who was presiding over the grievance hearings, and at that point was invited to witness the hearings themselves, but also take in the Wabash Valley with Judge Edmonds uh, to where he could see both the Potawatomi and the Miami in their villages. Um, so while he was in Logansport, um, he was specifically asked by government agents to make portraits of specific Potawatomi headmen. The first of which was Iowa. He was a, a young leader. Um, the government considered him to be a war chief. 
Um, and from the success of that portrait, he began to befriend Iowa and other leaders who also encouraged him to visit them in their villages and to record life there before they had to leave. Uh, so in doing so, he was invited to several villages um, in the Wabash Valley al along the Yellow River, eventually making his way to Kiwane, where a pivotal uh, council was being held to voice grievances and removal negotiations in 1837. So the painting that he made at the council that was happening at Kiwane's village is one that we highlight really prominently on the museum floor in the exhibit on our removal. We have an entire wall that we've sort of dedicated to this painting, and it's a really critical piece. It's actually on display um, at the Indiana University Museum of Anthropology and Archaeology in Bloomington, Indiana, and it's a, it's a great piece because it is very obvious that George Winter had spent time with these individuals and was not just sort of making a generalized painting of government agents and Native Americans. He was actually doing portraiture. He spent time sketching the faces of these individuals and he has other sketches that he did. Um, you know, there are some that are um, depicting ceremonial scenes and social gatherings and dancing and things like that. So you really do, when you look through all of his works, you get the feel that he spent enough time that he was trying to sort of learn the social dynamics, maybe who the prominent headmen were, who had a certain social standing, who were friends, who grouped together in the hours when the, the councils weren't happening to really get a feel for the subjects that he was painting. And the, the painting of the council at Kiwane's village really does a great job of showing that he does have at least some degree of this formalized training because this is very much a painting that is has intentional composition. You know, composition is one of those things that in Art History 101 is one of the first things that you learn about that when the artist is making the decisions about where to place a, a key individual, the lighting, the, the lines of sight, all of those things have meaning. And so when we look at the painting of Kiwane's village, we see, for example, to the left side, Naswake, one of our tribal leaders, and he's wearing a long white coat. Now, we have other sketches and, and works that Winter did of Naswake so that we know that he has depicted him more than once in this white coat. So yes, he probably was wearing a light colored or a white coat, but putting one figure in solid white also is an artistic decision. He not only puts Naswake in this long white coat, he intentionally paints it so that it looks like a shaft of light, of sunlight, is coming through the trees, the canopy, and is, is focused in on Naswake. So he is very much meant to be the focal point of this painting. He has clustered around him people who are his allies, people who are other headmen, and it's very clear that he is speaking on behalf of this contingent that's gathered around him. And Naswake has, you know, that, that prominent white coat, but he also has his hand raised and extended slightly, which helps to draw your eye, the sight line, over to the next sort of cluster of individuals in this composition, which is the the government officials, the people who, the scribe, the um, Indian agents, the people who were there to have this council, to hear these grievances. And it's very clear that George Winter made the decision, if you look at the composition, he put them right under the American flag, right in front of a tent. He actually, they probably were sitting at a table, but it, it also serves as a, a device to show that separation. They are separated from, you know, where the, the other tribal uh, community members are sitting around in a more casual fashion. Some are laying down, some are leaning against a tree, others are sort of standing, you know, looking very comfortable and casual where the government officials are very buttoned up. They're behind that, that table to sort of separate themselves. And one of the key figures of the government official cluster um, is actually looking off to the far right of the painting, which also draws the sight line over, and he's looking at another tribal official who has his back to us. So it looks very much like there's back and forth conversation that is happening, and Naswake is 
maybe speaking and, and raising his hand while this other government official is looking at yet another tribal leader off to his, to, to his left. And it helps to draw the viewer's sightline across and take in all of these different groupings. So it's really fascinating when you're thinking about the decisions that George Winter was making of, you know, you want to ask yourself sometimes, like, did he have an opinion about this council? Did he have an opinion about who was right and who was wrong and whether the grievances that these tribal members had were legitimate in his opinion? Um, these are all things that you can sort of wonder and question because George Winter, you know, he made this painting to make money. He made this painting to establish himself as an artist, but whether or not he likes it, it's also a political painting. Um, and it would have been viewed at the time with people who had very strong opinions about Native American removal and whether it was fair and you know whether the government was dealing with Native populations in an appropriate fashion. So this was a this was a hot political topic at the time. So he wasn't being completely neutral by choosing to engage with this kind of material. Um, Blake, I think you, it would be really great if you want to talk about how we can look at some of the individual portraiture that George Winter did and how we see those individuals and their personality and characteristics come through in the final composition. Well, sort of being an outsider um, and also being aligned with the officials, uh, the tribesmen were able to tell this right off the bat. Uh, some of them befriended him, uh, like Iowa that we had mentioned before. Um, others had wanted to have nothing to do with him whatsoever. So really he had to kind of be sneaky in ways um, and collect field sketches from afar, uh, which in a lot of his artwork you can tell that he had done. Um, many people are in just natural positions. Um, they're not set up in, in some sort of um, specific position that he wanted to do, like a, like a studio work or things like that. So some of the lighting might be a little bit off, so he focuses on other attributes and other details like their clothing um, or their, some of their facial features if he's able to see it. Um, but many times people were just in a relaxed state and he wanted them to be like that. He wanted to capture them in what their daily life was like prior to removing. Um, and I think again, like Kelly had said, this was um, definitely politically charged. Um, he knew that it was. Um, and he knew that he needed to sort of calm the, the tone and the mood um, so that he could really capture them in the state that he wanted to, especially for historical posterity. When we use this work today, uh, we highlight George Winter's work, not necessarily because he was a great American master. You know, I don't know that he will be, ever be held up in the canon of great American uh, artists. Um, being British, but also that he was young. You know, I, I think he would have been in his early 20s at this point. He really had a lot to learn yet as an artist, but why it is so critical for us is because it does allow us to talk about the historical circumstances that were going on around the time, the, the sketches that he was making in the time that he was making them. He did to make an effort to also sketch some of these social scenes where we're able to highlight and look at the fact that he, he, was, he was drawing things that he maybe didn't even understand what he was drawing. Um, for example, there's a scene where there's dancing and a ceremonial gathering that's happening and he has depicted a water drum and he has de depicted other things that are in this composition that he may not realize what those things meant, but we can look back at them today and realize that certain religious traditions are being carried out in this, this image that he's drawing where he's just capturing what he sees and he himself does not even understand for us today how that was capturing a moment to show what, what elements of our culture were being portrayed and being played out in this scenario. Um, so they're really great for us to look at because he was just sketching what he saw and, and not putting necessarily too much of his own interpretation onto it. Um, so I, I think personally the field sketches are just as much or maybe even more interesting than maybe the final composition because it's, it's a little bit of, you know, as a historian, you like to read the actual primary documents. You like to go back and, and read the notes. You, you like to see maybe someone's 
thoughts sort of sketched in the notes of, of an address that hasn't been fully edited yet. Though That's the really great stuff. So that's what I appreciate about the works of George Winter is being able to see the evolution of field sketches to maybe more refined field sketches until the final works that he put, did in his studio and put color to. It really does capture a, a really great snapshot of what Potawatomi culture and life was like in 1837 when he was sort of milling about among our people, just sketching what he saw. Okay, so that's our, our general thoughts and feelings about the work of George Winter. We really encourage you to come and visit the Cultural Heritage Center if you get a chance to look at the different ways we've utilized his work in the museum exhibits. Um, you can also check out our website. We have some other materials that are associated with his works and specifically some of the individuals that he drew portraits of. And we really encourage you to just think a little bit more about all of the resources that we have to learn about this really critical time period in our ancestors' history and in our tribal, tribal history. And just keep coming back to us and trying to learn as much as you can. We appreciate it. Miigwech. Thank you.